and between your offspring and her, and this is where the, 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 King, the King James actually does a better job than the NIV here, and her seed, singular, and the woman's seed, and her seed. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. See, in this verse we see God love demonstrated, but you know, it doesn't sound like it, does it? It sounds like there's a, a crushed head, there's a bruised heel, there's enmity, there's a lot of stuff going on here. But in this sentence to the serpent, God pronounces an end to man's battle with the force of evil. There, there's three parts of this. First is the enmity, the enmity. We will never be friends with Satan. He's not to be trusted. We are to hate him. By the way, uh, we kind of, most people here have a good hatred for snakes, don't they? Does anybody here have a pet rattlesnake? Because if you do, you're sick. <laughs> and so I will let you know Because you see a snake, the first thing most people think is, kill that sucker. Okay? And it's okay. And it goes back to this. They are not to be trusted. When we were in it, did we, I think we showed a picture of any of these people, didn't we? It, with the, with, we have cobras there. And the, our friends will go up, they'll, they'll kiss you on the eye. I touched the back of it, but somebody had a very firm grip on the front. Okay, I, I have no love for snakes, but I have less love for Satan. God put enmity. We are not to be friends of Satan. Anybody that's a friend of Satan, do you want to be around that person? I'm serious. They, that their life is one of darkness and destruction, and, and they just literally, as nice as they want to be, they want to hurt so there's enmity, but secondly, there's the battle and between the evil one and the seed of woman. Now, there's battle between us and Satan. There's no doubt about that. But the ultimate battle was between Satan and the seed of woman. There's only been one person to ever fall under that description. That was Jesus Christ. He was born of Mary by the miraculous intervention of God. He was not born of Joseph and Mary or Ken and Susan. We can, we can get in a lot. No, no. He was, of all the people ever created, he was created in virgin birth. Is it? And as a result of that, he is that special person that was going to do battle with Satan. And if you've, if you've ever seen the, the movie, The Passion of the Christ, where Jesus gives up the ghost on the cross, and the, the woman that, that plays Satan, she was freaky looking. Man, she's scary. I don't, I don't know. I was married to her. I, I don't know. I just never wanted to. Shave her head and do her eyebrows again. <laughs> but she's screaming and she's having this celebration. Because when Jesus died on the cross, they go, I won, I won. <laughs> but not really. Because you see, that was inflicting the pain on the heel of the Holy One, the seed of the woman. But what did Jesus do? In that fell swoop, he smashed the head of Satan. Because Satan no longer has power over you and I. And that's where the victory comes in. The victory, folks. We have victory over Satan when we are born again because the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he can't touch us anymore. We can give him power over us. That's our issue. It's not God's. Jesus died so that you and I could have complete and utter victory. And the battle and the victory are summed up in the New Testament this way in John 3.16. Kim, you preach John 3.16 every week. Yeah, probably. And uh, John, I just love it, man. We got to get John 3.16. I can't even find it right now. I'm in the right book. I'm turning to Matthew. John 3.16, folks. If you don't have it memorized, mesmerize it, okay? I mean, you got to have it. For God so loved the world that he gave. How many kids did he have? One only son. His one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. To give victory to the world through Jesus. And anybody that accepts Jesus has victory. We have victory over the evil one. The fall of man, God reveals. And the, think about that. Adam and Eve still had the juice running down their face from the forbidden fruit. And God is laying out the way for them to be redeemed. Laying out the way for them to be restored in a relationship with Him. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And the motivation for God to do this was his enduring love and his faithfulness. Uh, if you don't have this memorized, I, I, I want to challenge you this. Uh, Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. Turn there right now. Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. It's real simple. Real simple. Psalm 117, verse 1 and 2 says this. It says, Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Extol him, all ye peoples. For great is his love towards us. 
And the faithfulness of the Lord endures for how long? Forever. Praise the Lord. So even when God, the, the dark, one of the darkest times in mankind's history, when man slammed her back on God, so broke the one rule, God was laying out the way in his faithfulness and his love for mankind that they could be saved. So there should have been no hope after the fall. It's a good thing I'm not God. <laughs> it just wouldn't have went that well. We just put it that way. I'd have fried them both and started from scratch. And so you know what you do? You get a cake that doesn't work out well, what do you do? Just put that sucker in the trash can and just start over again. And that's what I'd have done with Adam and Eve. Praise God, I am not God. So there should have been no hope. But there also should have been for the Jews. Because you see, the first thing we're talking about, even in the fall of man, God's love is evident. But secondly, this morning, even in the fall of Israel, God's love is evident. We don't know who wrote these words in Psalm 100. A lot of the Psalms say Psalm of David, a Psalm of Asaph. It'll tell you who the author is. We don't know who wrote Psalm 100 specifically. But look at verse 5 again. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues for all generations. By the way, faithfulness continues for all generations is basically another way of saying His faithfulness endures forever. We've got that here. Well, in Joshua 24, verses 11 through 14, uh, Joshua is going to retire. He's, he's about to go to the retirement home. Uh, his, you know, he's placed on a golf course down in Florida. And so uh, he's, he's laying all this out, and he calls all the people of Israel together. He says, here's what's going on. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. You want to serve the gods of your fathers like before Abraham, the god beyond the river? You go serve them gods. Or if you like those gods that we, we put a whooping on down in Egypt, you go serve those gods. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A lot of you got that on a plaque on your wall. We do. It's right in our kitchen. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 24, 15. And you know what all the people said at that point? Amen! Yeah, preach it, brother! And they all went, we're going to serve the Lord, we're going to serve the Lord. But what about their kids? The very next generation, guess what they did? Turned serving on the other guys. Rejected God. It's amazing. And, and then we get, that's where we get into the book of Judges. And if you read the book of Judges, and it's a little confusing. You have to back off a little bit to get the full picture. Here's what happens. The children of Israel, they reject God and start chasing other gods. God lets an opposing and oppressing nation come in and take them over and burn their crops and literally take their children into slavery and destroy the land. And so after a couple years of that, they start going, Oh, God, we're sorry, we're stupid, we repent. And guess what God does? He raises up a judge, normally in the form of a general of an army. They put a big whip and they throw the bad guys out and they all go, Praise the Lord! And then about a few years later, guess what they start doing again? And it's a cycle that repeats, repeats, repeats. Sometimes the judge is a very localized judge over just one of the tribes. Sometimes it's the whole nation of Israel. But it's over and over and over again because they have this hard time following God time in and time out. We come to Solomon. Solomon is dedicating the temple. Go, go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. 1 and Kings. Excuse me. 1 and Samuel. 1 and Kings. And 1 and 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, the seventh chapter. Very familiar scripture. As soon as we read it, go, oh, my God. Probably on your Still no email from that guy. Walls all Jesus up like we do. Uh, but <clears throat> once again, God is going to remind Solomon and all of Israel of his love. But listen to how it starts. So Solomon dedicates the temple. He's done this big public deal. And after that, verse, chapter 7, verse 11, when Solomon finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in his mind to do for the temple of the Lord in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night, just to him, and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, here's what God promised. You turn to other gods, I will not let it rain, and the ground below you will become as bronze. You ever, you ever try to dig in the dirt here when it dries out? You need a daggum slit. I mean, you do. You almost need a jackhammer. We had what was called jack wax back in the part of Ohio we used to live at. And they would literally, they would bring in, to cut the dirt, they would bring in 
you know, jackhammers. It was amazing. And then when it's wet, it just sticks to everything you try to dig with. There's, there's no wind. Well, God says, I will shut up the heavens so that there is no rain. I will command locusts to devour your land and send a plague among your people. By the way, plagues work to give people rashes. Plagues kill people. So I'm going to stop the rain. I'm going to send pests. And I'm going to kill people. Got that? It's because they go against me. Verse 14. But if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Did you hear that? All the bad stuff they do, if they would ever just fall down and humbly worship God, he'd fix them. And you know what he did? He kept that promise over and over again. Over and over again. If same cycle, there'd be a good king in Judah and then a bad king. God would send in an army, put a whip on them. They'd say, we're sorry. A good king would come. Everything was good again. There was no armies attacking them. Even when the army did, bad things happened to the army, not to them. It was amazing. And then God, twice, and I don't understand this, so just bear with me. Twice, God wiped Israel off the face of the earth. Twice. 600 B.C. He sends Nebuchadnezzar and says, go in there and just put it up. And he just total. This, this temple in Solomon was, was, was built about around 648, or excuse me, B.C. 640, uh, uh, B.C. 600 B.C. They, they level that side. There's, there's not one stone left on top of another. They, they tear down the walls of the great city of Jerusalem. They carry out people in activity, kill a bunch of them too. 49 years, 50 years later, seven, seven silence. God lets them come back, start rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the city. But it worked out for about another 600 years. And then they forgot about him again. And when Jesus came, did they accept him with open arms? Crucified. They put the very Son of God, the Messiah, on a cross and crucified him. Some 40 years later, God came in and guess what he did to that temple? And it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It had walls of gold on the inside of it. Not one stone is left in And we can go to Jerusalem, maybe some of you will with us this next year. You can go there and you can see the remnants of what the stones were. You can't see the temple. It was completely devastated. Unbelievable. And then what's God do in May of 1948? He gives Israel back their nation. We were just reading yesterday in the prophecy study we're doing on, on, on uh, uh, Saturday. And in, in Ezekiel, it says that I will bring them back to their land. I will bring them back to their land. 1948, that came true. There's 7 million Jews today in Israel, the land that he gave to Abraham. Because God's faithfulness and God's love endures forever. That just amazes me. It utterly amazes me. I have a hard time getting my hard time. He said, I'd have fried them. I wouldn't give them their land back. I don't care what I said to them. He said, you, you were such bad guys to deal with. Forget the deal. It's off. We do that nowadays, don't we? Not God. God is so absolutely incredible. And there's only one better example of God's love and enduring faithfulness than Israel. And that's the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ becomes the ultimate symbol of God's love and His faithfulness for all of mankind. Go to, go to Galatians, the third chapter. We, we, we studied this last week. But Galatians, the third chapter, Acts, first, uh, Acts Romans, 1st and Corinthians, and then Galatians is right after that. Galatians, that third chapter, verse 26. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. We need to get all over us again. You all, that you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, this is amazing, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What he says here, once you're born again, your ethnicity doesn't matter. Your social status doesn't matter. Your gender doesn't matter. You are a child of God. But it gets even better. Because, see, even in the cross of, of Jesus, the promise...